Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. Photographer Max de Esteban lives and works in Barcelona. We are thrilled to have him here tonight on occasion of his solo show at Klumchin Gallery, which is currently on view. Uh, Max is a Fulbright alumnus who holds a PhD from the Universitat Ramon Lull in Catalonia and a master's from Stanford University. His work has been featured at the Deutsches Technik Museum, Rencontre Internacional at the Palais de Tokyo, Paris, and Darmstadter Tag der Fotografie, among others. He is the recipient of the National Award of Professional Photography in Spain, and the Jury Special Award in Photo Festival Poland. Um, collections include the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Museo de Arte Moderna do Rio de Janeiro, and the Deutsches Technik Museum. Max has published three monographs to date, uh, Elegies of Manumission, Nasrelli Press, 2012, Heads Will Roll, Hatje Kant, 2014, which was selected as a book of the year by Lens Culture, Proposiciones, Propositions, La Fabrica Editorial, 2015. So please give a warm welcome to Max de Esteban to our lecture series. Thank you very much. Um, okay, first of all, thank you very much for your coming here. It's a real honor. I would like to thank also Jaime for inviting me to these lectures and the School of Visual Arts for hosting this event. So, I really I want to thank you all, uh, but especially you for coming. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is about photography now. Uh, its challenges, its uh, opportunities, and its difficulties. Um, but I would like to start with a caveat, which is the following. I'm not a scholar, and that means that uh, this is going to be a sort of performance lecture, which translates into my ambition here is not to convince anybody about my ideas. My ambition here is, if I'm successful, to challenge some of your ideas. But uh, you know, it's up to you to decide whether it are worthwhile or not. And again, I'm not trying to convince and to portray a thesis that should be right or wrong. Um, what you're going to listen is sort of perhaps an old style manifesto, which basically manifestos in the old avant-garde were had two objectives. The first one was to push ideas to the limit, to their limit, to the limit of nearly the nonsense. But secondly, and even more important, to push the ideas into action. So the format that you are going to see in my presentation is to try to push these ideas to their, as I was saying, the limits of the nonsense. Um, I think that that's the right mood to think about photography today. We are, uh, because Basically, I think that in the same way that the society and our world is changing for, in a deep sense, and we will talk about why that is the case, I think photography is also ready for a major change. And, it, and we are already leaving the first stages of this uh, uh, complete change in the basic premises of what photography is about. So I will discuss three things uh, today in this presentation. First, one thing that has been an essential topic for photography since its invention, it's 150 years ago, which is the relationship of photography with the real, with the truth. We will revise the historical assumptions in that, in, with that concept. The second is why I believe that digital changed everything forever. And that the, those assumptions that have led all the critical discussions on photography until today are obsolete uh, going forward. And the last part will be a bit about how this all relates to my work. Um, you will see that in most of the slides, certainly in the first part, there are some book references. Um, there are, most of them are very recent, are over the last 10 years, most of them. Uh, that doesn't mean that those books, I agree with them, but all of them are written by very smart people that even when I disagree, they challenge myself. So I, I, there are recommendations to all of you if if you're interested in the specific topic. So what I would like to start is with something very basic. We start with a first question, which is, what is photography for you? And the, a second corollary, which is, why should you care? 
And basically what I have collected here is, is two definitions, one coming from Encyclopedia Britannica and the other one from Wikipedia. One represents the uh, old tradition of photography and the other one we might say the new one. And just let's read it for a second and I will highlight the crucial differences among both. Britannica says, photography is the method of recording the image of an object through the action of light. And it, it sounds uh, quite, um, quite okay. But then Wikipedia says something completely different. It says it's the science, art, and practice of creating durable images by recording light. Between these two definitions, there are at least, at least the one that I see, is there are two contradictions. The first one is the role of the photographer. What does the photographer actually do? Record or create? Britannica says that they, what the photographer does is record. Wikipedia is create. But the second, and also quite interesting, is what does the camera do? Uh, one, it says that records an image, and the other says records light. Let's go back to the tradition of 150 years of photography. The traditional stand was Britannica's. Is of what a photographer does is to record. And that has, comes with huge implications, conceptual implications and moral implications even. Because if record has also, recording has also its definition. And recording is to give evidence of something. And evidence also comes with its own definition. Evidence is that this something exists, it's real, and it's true. So the tradition of recording implies two very important assumptions. One is that the object is true, and second, that its image is true. So the first thesis that I'm going to advance in, in, of this presentation is that precisely this link with reality, this supposed link with the real, with the truth of photography, which has, was and has been and still is for some or for many, the essence of photography, together with the idea that the true reflect, uh, representation of a world is the linear perspective, the you know the that comes from the Renaissance, and this is a, a very Eurocentric uh, concept. Both are deeply first reactionary, and they are false. So that's the first assumption, and we'll see how I develop that. Because let's explore some of the implications of this traditional assumption, uh, some historical uh, um, implications. A very substantial part of the work that it was done early on in the turn of the, 20, of the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century, was, you know, if photography represents the real, the truth, and you are a political photographer, conscientious, concerned about repression, uh, uh, concerned about democracy, then photography should be, should represent and show, should show the truth of the oppression, the truth of the subjugation, the truth of the, of the humiliation um, in, your, the, in the places where you live. So the role of the photographer would be to certify through photography that that was the case. So the assumption, and that has been a long tradition that still is in a very substantial part of, of today's photography is photography is the best tool, the perfect tool to represent this situation. It's the best tool to represent and to promote democracy. It's the best tool to promote freedom. Okay, so that, that was the assumption. And this is why, let's, yep, what, what I call the democratic document was born. The idea of representing the social movements and the social truth of our societies through photography and through this link to the real. But, but what happened very early on is that, you know, yes, it's true, it was great to show democracy, but the Nazis did a fantastic use of uh, photography as a political tool. And the Soviets also did a fantastic tool of extraordinary and you know, allow me the word, extraordinary qu uh, aesthetic quality and extremely convincing. So suddenly a lot of people start sort of doubting about you know, uh, photography as a political truth, a political instrument to show the truth. And you know, there were 
immediately, very soon, uh, intellectuals that start saying, well, you know, you know, the reality is that photography, a photographer uh, has nothing to do with objectivity and everything about subjectivity. You know, and, and here we can refer to Bertolt Brecht, we can uh, refer to Walter Benjamin, which is an overused but extremely important uh, thinker of photography. So some people started realizing that photography, the, the obvious link with truth and was not so simple. And that, what, that represented the first big disappointment of the relationship between photography and the real. Still people today, very smart people, defend this position. And I have highlighted two books here, Ariel Azoulay, which is a fantastic book of 2008, and T.J. Demos, which is also a, a very significant critic, U.S. critic, in 2013. They have these two books that defend this position still today, um, in a very smart way. Uh, again, I, I don't agree with them, but I think that they are the best type of defensors of this idea of the link with truth and the political action of photography. For me, a much better book that relates this dilemma is the one by Boris Groys, who I think it's a professor in, no, I, I know it's a professor in NYU, that has the, written this book called Our Power in 2008, which is a great book that I highly recommend. So, okay, let's, let's agree that, you know, we can do, uh, that there's no objective uh, political work in photography, nothing like this link to the truth, but n n uh, to objectivity. But let's, some people then thought, okay, if we cannot do objective, real photography, why not subjective real photography? And if we can do subjective photography, again, link to the real, why not do it beautiful? And if, which would represent the triumph of humanism. And again, this is a very American tradition, and with extraordinary photographers, that created what it's called, or, or what I call, the aesthetic document. Here is, on the one hand, aesthetic, but on the other, a document, a document that certifies reality. This attitude towards photography had two problems, and, or one problem, which is a moral one. Because, you know, this is a very famous Walter Egan's uh, uh, image that I'm sure you, everybody knows here. But, the, you know, in front of poverty, what do you do, a photographer of this line? make them pose. This is Salgado film. If in front of exploitation, you look for the perfect composition and crop. And you know, the, the great thing about this type of work is that you don't have to pay the models. They come for free. You know, they, why should you? I mean, you are doing, you know, political work. You are trying to, you know, progress the democracy in the world. And at the same time, you're doing great art. They should be thankful. This was immediately, or not immediately, but in the 80s spotted. And perhaps the strongest criticism of this approach to photography linked to the real and the subjective was by Martha Rosler, who did this uh, fantastic critique precisely on Walker Evans, where she went back to see what had happened to the famous models of Walker Evans. And the truth is that they were as disparaged, as poor, uh, as they were found first by Evans. So yes. This guy was now very, very, uh, very famous. Um, they were icons of American photography, but had no, imp no implication for the good for those people. And um, Martha, obviously, criticized that in a, in a very sort of uh, artistic, but deep way. Her point was, you know, by doing that, we've made this person twice a victim. A victim because of the system that oppresses them, and a system and a, a victim by the photographer that has exploited it once again. So that was the second disappointment of this relationship between politics, the truth, the real in photography. Uh, in the 80s and 90s, a fe a phenom uh, people were very conscious about that. And there was a literary, especially for, came from literary critics, a movement whereby uh, they start saying, you know, the real is something very difficult to define. And, you know, it's very complex and, and it's not simple. It, we have to rethink. And the narrative, because the real for us is constructed narratives. 
This is a typical discourse of the postmoderns that we'll talk a bit mm, immediately. So they challenged any narrative and its relationship to the real. Everything, in a sense, is a fiction. And uh, the fact that narratives were recognized as fictions was, in fact, a major step forward in understanding our relationship with reality. So this step that I am going now to talk about uh, was a clear advance. But only it left this advance with regard to photography only halfway. Because that was the postmodern solution. The postmodern solution had basically two tenets. One is that if narratives are fictions, I, artists, can create my own valid narrative. That's the first assumption. The second assumption with regard to photography was, you know, photography locks into the real because it's an indexical instrument. And this was the word of the times, index. I mean, we have tons of articles and essays and about the indexical nature of this. And that means that photography, it's an imprint of reality, and as such, it really continues locking with our real. So postmodernism, in a sense, was on the one hand a criticism of the narrative nature, the fictitious na na narrative nature of the real, but on the other hand, it defended the nature of photography as a visual locking with the real. And as I say here, at the end of what happened was like, you know, the, these uh, natural science museums where you have these dioramas that, you know, they're, they're, that's what uh, was developed by a big number of, uh, and still is, uh, of photographers. Uh, you know, everybody was doing staged photography. So there was this criticism to the document, to photography as a document, but a total faith in the formal quality of photography. And again, I say that that was a major improvement. There's a book, which, I mean, it's, it's an excellent book. There are chapters that if somebody reads them and understands them, yeah, it would be very glad if somebody <laughs> explains it. But the, it's by Michael Fried. Michael Fried is one of, he's really done this book. And he's the prime defensor, uh, or perhaps the most sophisticated defensor of this line of thinking in photography. The truth is that reality does not, traditional reality, does not die easy. And uh, there is this new trend that I'm going to talk about. Uh, because the idea is, okay, if the photographer brings into photography subjectivity, why not expel the photographer? Let's, let's leave it out. Let's, I mean, who needs a photographer? And this is how the current or recent uh, trend, which is the smartphone document, and this marital document has basically, it's, what it says is, in a world invaded by smartphones, by videos, and by everything, the best document is the one that has no author. And, you know, and then you've seen very recently this, uh, we've been you know, covered by exhibitions on the Google machines and surveillance things, because the idea was, okay, photography still l links to the real. The only thing that we have to do is take out the photographer. There was also a, 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 some thing that I find it quite funny, which is, you know, the lower the technical skill, the better it is. I mean, it's the, the closer. If you, it's everything green or blue and pixeled, that means, that guarantees that this is something that is real. But the truth is that it's to no avail. And I will give you an example. When we, when Yui, we meaning the Westerners, receive these videos uh, of beheadings, by the EIS, which are horrible. But the first thing that State Department says is, oh, we have to check if they are real. And the funny thing is that it's not that they put a supercomputer to check the, the film itself. What they do is to speak to their spies, to people in the ground, and just check, confirm that this has happened. The document itself, it's just propaganda. It doesn't have any um, certified veracity. So here we are today in what probably most people think it's the deepest crisis of photography and its relation to the truth and the real. And the question is, is this important? Okay, fine. We have, I've spent some minutes talking about this thing. And what I will try now to develop is that it's not only important, it's very important, and it's great news. 
And it's great news for two reasons. The first one is that because since the start, photographers have been trying to escape the document. This is one of the first photos made. And uh, I mean, and this guy was pretending that he was dead. This is a very famous uh, photo that we all know until, you know, 10 years ago was discovered that these two were paid models. Photographers, since the beginning, have been trying to escape this idea of locking into the real. And in it, if you think about it, it makes sense. Because the nature of an artist is doubting about the real. Is knowing that reality is not as simple as science or, re re or reason makes us believe. Humans uh, are animals which their main characteristic is the ability to create fictions. There is this wonderful book by Noah Harari, who is a professor in Israel. That it, this is a book of 2013, so it's very recent, called Sapiens. And basically what he says is, look, the maximum coordination a group of people can really work together is 100 people. And they're all this type of tests. But you, can, you cannot build a pyramid with 100 people. You need millions of people to mobilize with an idea, with a belief. And the only way to mobilize this type of energy and coordination and creativity is through the creation of a narrative that puts us together. So he defends that the real difference between us and animals, and the rest of the animals, is this ability to create fictions. Um, I have put also two other fantastic books about you know, what truth and real means and the current status of philosophy in that area. And I, 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 I highly recommend these two books. The main idea is that facts on the one side and fiction are both constitutive of our own reality. And the way I try to explain this, this is like a room. And for convenience, we say, OK, facts in one side, fiction in the other. And there's this movable wall. But reality is this same wall. We cannot segregate that. So, so that's the first reason why this is great news. The second reason is that because also since the beginning, there has been a tradition in photography whereby feels that the camera is a prison, forces us to a way of looking that it's univocal, that it's only one way of looking at the world. And it's so efficient in this way that it's difficult to get out from its dictatorship. And this is the second thesis, that basically, because cameras and photography so efficient in the traditional way of looking things, fosters and limits, limits uh, formal innovation and fosters conservatism and nostalgia. Photography, if you, and there are books, many books about that, uh, and they, they mention it as a positive. It's a nostalgic medium. I don't know why that's positive. Uh, because what I think is this is precisely the reason why today photography, most of photography, is so boring and is so more of the same and it's so conservative or worst. It can be extremely reactionary of a reactionary, I would call it pictorialism of fairly bad taste. So this is a, the end of this first part with you know the locking between reality and and, and photography, but I would like to uh, recall uh, an anecdote that probably some of you or most of you will know, but it's by Bernard Shaw. Bernard Shaw said, <laughs> you know, I would trade all the art and paintings of the centuries of the Christ's crucifixion for a snapshot of the event. And yes, this is very uh, witty and very, I mean, funny, and, but think about it. Only an idiot can really believe on that. Would you really trade all the Caravaggios, the Rubens, the Velázquez for a snapshot of a tortured man? What is the moral or aesthetic value of an image of these beheadings? None. A snapshot of, a cru of the crucifixion would have the same moral in it or aesthetic value. None. So. What I would like to say then is, okay, 
here we are. And the question for us, photographers, curators, uh, gallerists, is, okay, what to do? If this is the case, what to do with photography? And obviously, I have the right answer. <laughs> joking. <laughs> the answer, or at least my answer, is embracing the digital. Uh, the digital in photography is questioning everything. And, you know, the three main things is, you know, it's production, it's distribution, and it's use. But the important thing to realize here is that uh, the digital digitalization is questioning photography, but it's questioning the rest of our lives. It's questioning our society, how we relate with each other. It's uh, questioning technology with the, the rise of cy cybernetics as a overwhelming technology. It's, uh, cha it's changing the way we produce things, manufacturing uh, sites. It's changing our economy in a huge way. And I would say even human nature is going to be changed by digitalization. And this is precisely my area of most interest today and, and very related to Hedge Will Roll. So on the one hand, we have this major change in photography that has this huge implication and vice versa in the rest of the world. Most photographers work with the convenience. It's very convenient. I mean, digi di digital is great. It's very convenient. You can do a lot of things. But at the end of the day, the question is not how convenient it is, but if it really reacts a new way of thinking. And that's what only a minority of photographers even today are realizing what uh, the implications of the digital in photography. And when one has to remember that the essence of, of art is the questioning, not, not the answers. We don't have answers to anything. And if I pretend to give answers, it's just to challenge you. But the reality is that doubt is the permanent stage of an artist. And you know, today we should be thrilled, passionately thrilled, that we are living a historical moment where the world, but also our medium, our, our chosen medium, the medium that we have chosen, is undertaking this amazing, amazing change. And we should be motivated, excited. Uh, we should be looking at what implications that it has for the society and for us. Um, because this change in photography is coincidental with a change in, and we'll talk a bit later on that, in, a, in the way we understand the world. We are in, at the down of a bio reproduction where in the past, in the 20th century, was the mechanical reproduction, the way of producing things. And that made photography the, the visual medium of the 20th century, of modernity. Now, we have a challenge now. This is, this, this is old, old news. And we are under, undertaking a major change in our ways of life. So how photography is going to relate to this new world, it depends on us, on the people that are here. And so anyway, it's true that it's very exciting. But it's also true that you know changes are you know uh, tentative, risky. We don't know how the things are going to end, uh, confusing. And this is why, at least that's my thinking, why we are seeing this comeback for the last 15 years of traditional mediums. You know, going back to the analog, to the Polaroids. Who wants to see a cyanotype again? Um, we are seeing this comeback because, and again, it's. It's fine. I mean, everybody can do whatever they want. But it's clearly a longing for stability, for the world that we knew, for, for the comfort of the, of the known. So a personal decision, and again, as a photographer, a gallerist, a curator, and anything is fine, obviously, is which camp are you going to join? The, jo camp, the camp that you know, accepts risks and challenges with all its frustrations, or looks for the comfort of a, of a easier life? And again, you can do fantastic photographic work looking at the past. The question is the significance of that work. And that's not for me to say. Because the reality is that this risk, this accepting the new, is really difficult. And I will show you an example. This guy is George Bellows. And by definition, and he was, at his time, the most acclaimed painter in America. And in fact, if you look at it, he's, he's an excellent painter. You can see this is 1913. You can see a bit of Cezanne down there, the strokes of expressionism there. It's a high quality, daring painting.
painting. He, 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 he was selling like crazy at his time. But I'm sure that nobody knows him here. Nobody even remembers him. And how come? How come some, such an excellent painter, uh, famous at his time, he was a wealth, wealthy guy, nobody remembers him today? The problem is very simple. It's this one. Is that by 1912, Picasso was doing this thing. And, you know, and he w changed, him and others, changed the way painting, um, it changed painting forever. I mean, the way these guys changed painting changed the way we understand painting for the rest of history. So the contemporaries that were doing excellent work but were not in this camp have been forgotten. But let's not cheat ourselves. Let's go back. Let's imagine we are now in 2013. Come on. Reality. This, this is great. This is a great painting. This, this is a mess. <laughs> this is innovative, creative, but following tradition. This is very strange. I know what's going on here. I mean, what the hell is this? <laughs> so, you know, at that time, it was really difficult to join this camp, as it will be difficult to join any camp that challenges convention. Let's go, just as a matter of exercise, 10 years later, so 1925. And now it's much easier to decide which camp to join. I mean, this is Everett that by the way, he was a darling of, uh, of the New York rich. They, he was doing this theater paintings very successfully. He was selling like cheese. Uh, but the truth is that one doesn't need too much discernment to realize that this was not going anywhere. But let's look at the other side. This is Malevich with his students. What they were doing 10 years later makes look Picasso as a classic. That was the black things, and you, you all know Malevich's work. Again, because the problem of being in the border is that it's never comfortable. It doesn't matter. One thing, oh, I've accepted Picasso. No, no. Ten years later, you have to be doing a very different thing. And it's this being in the border that it's suited for some people and for others don't. The message that I would like to convey is that modern painting changed forever between 1910 and 1930. I am convinced that photography is under going a similar change. And the photography we are going to see in 20 years will have nothing to do with the photography we've been seeing for 150 years. And again, this I find it very exciting. So, okay, embracing the digital. That's easy to say, but what the hell does it mean? And here what I would like to say is, you know, we are now in tentative territory. And there's obviously no answer. And uh, each one has to find its own way of what does it mean to embrace a new world. And I, the only thing I can talk is the thing I am trying to do. And th that doesn't mean that I, I'm right or, or wrong or whatever. I have no idea. But that's what I try to do. And the first thing is that, for me, it has been always an issue of breaking the rules. And if you use this, this way of thinking, then the way to articulate what you want to do becomes a bit simpler. Because then what you have to first is, say, the second thing you have to do is to identify which rules you want to break. But the, it's an easier thing that you know, a generalist statement is embracing the digital. And in my case, uh, there's this paragraph uh, that has been extremely helpful for me. And this is a paragraph that comes from art since 1900 and from a fantastic um, essayist and critic and philosopher, Rosalind Krauss, that I'm sure you know. Uh, I, I rarely, I'm rarely in agreement with her, but she's extremely smart. I mean, she really, you have to listen to her carefully. And she's wrote in 2004, so it's 10 years ago. No, it's not, you know, digital was already a strong force. She said, I'm going to read it because it's crucial for, for my work. At least for the time being, 
And this caveat is interesting. So the traits long associated with photography, and she then she mentions three traits. Monocular perspective, which is linear perspective, realism, and above all, documentary referentiality remain natural enough to us that any digital alteration of these terms, of these traits, <coughs> still appears disruptive. And the question is, OK, that's great. Those are the three traits that we have to challenge if we want to follow this, uh, if we in, are in agreement with this classification of the essence of traditional photography. Our exciting targets to destroy. Let's, uh, let's uh, um, go and see what each of these things means. Uh, and I, I change a bit the order, but it's just for the matter of convenience from what comes later. The first one is realism. And realism, we all know more or less what it is. Now it's that it's transparent, that it's unmediated, untouched, the indexical again, that it's analog, that it's continuous, all these definitions. But at the end of the day, what realism means is that there is a supposed way that we see things without alteration. This supposed way is defined as realism. The second is monocular perspective. And again, anybody who has studied history of art knows what's that. I mean, it's linear perspective, the center of vision, the illusion of depth and distance. And this is one of the strengths of photography, of traditional photography. And basically, it's the illusion of, a, of three dimensions in a bidimensional plane. That's what monocular perspective is. And lastly, and very important because Rosalind Krauss says that it's crucial or it's uh, uh, most important thing is documentary referentiality, which is what we've been talking about until now, which is this relationship with the document, with the truth, with, uh, with the real. At the end of the day, it, it's the understanding of photography as a temporal freeze of an event that has happened in the real world, in the real quote unquote world. Okay, let's go and see why challenging these three principles is not capricious. It's not, you know, for the, it's not a butad, it's not just for the sake of, you know, being avant-garde. Because the thesis, what I'm trying, going to try to say is that the digital al alters these principles in a dramatic way for good reasons. Let's go with realism, first trait. What happens in the, what happened in the analog world? Light would impact a sensitive film. This film would be the original, the file. Out of this file, copies would be made. And the matching of the original and the copies would be unquestionable. You would see this is, this is the negative and these are the copies. S simple, direct relationship. Now, what happens in the digital world? Light impacts a sensor. A CPU transforms these electrical signals into zeros and ones. These numbers, this file with numbers, are the original, the file. And then there's a software that transforms these zeros and ones into an image. So, and allow me to go through this because the digital file, the zeros and ones, is invisible. You cannot see it. It is a code. It's a text. The original, the file, is invisible. Very different from the analog world. The copy, the image, is a highly mediated interpretation of an invisible file. And that means that there's no reference that matches original and copy. It is the design of the software that creates this type of image. Different software, different image. Now, OK, so <coughs> works of engineer, fine. In, very, so what? So that means that all these discussions of the last 50 years of the indexical nature of photography, which is what related was the intellectual base grounding for the justification of the log with the real, is dead. There is no more indexical nature of photography. And that means that you are free to do whatever you want, which is great. And let me just give you this example. This, this image comes from one of the first series of propositions. It's called Proposition 1, Only the Ephemeral. 
And this series is, uh, allow me, I think it's a, it's a very interesting <laughs> uh, series about uh, technology, obsolescence, and art. And I, but, but I don't want to get into the content of, because I, I, want, I want to stick into the formal side of photography, not the content side. What I was trying to do here is breaking with realism and showing that in a bi-dimensional plane, you can show three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions, whatever dimensions you want. And it works. It formally works. It's not a strange, it's not, it's not disruptive from a visual standpoint. And what I also wanted is to challenge the understanding of what a photo is. People came here to this series and said, okay, what's this? This is an x-ray. It's a blueprint. It's a drawing. Some people thought it was, I mean, it's difficult to appreciate here, but you know, it really has the drawing quality. And it's not. It's a photo. What happens? It's a photo made in the 21st century with the tools the 21st century gives us. Let's go for the second trait, monocular perspective. And again, why the digital destroys this thing. Any code, any text, is subject to translations, to interpretations, to rewritings. The camera structure, which is the one that forces us to the um, uh, linear perspective, to the monocular perspective, comes from the structure of the camera oscura from, from the Renaissance. But it's just one of these potential translations. The file is, remember, is a code that gets translated by software. There is, and this is, I think it's an important point, there is no reason why this software should give precedence to linear perspective. This is a cultural bias, and in fact it's a westerner bias. Think about the history of art of you know, 5,000 years or 6,000 years. Linear perspective has, was invented in Europe and adopted in America for a period of 300 years, 400 years if, you, if we are very generous. What about the rest of art? What about the African art, the Asian art, the art made in Europe before the Renaissance? Is it not art? Is it not valid? It's a pure convention. has nothing to do, linear perspective has nothing to do with the real, neither with nature. So it's an obligation of us artists to recognize that linear perspective is one translation, valid, very beautiful, with a long tradition of great works, but it's only one tradition in a very, very varied uh, art system. So the digital precisely allows photography for infinite translations. It's great. It's great news. We have many things to invent. Suddenly we are, our world is open to very fascinating ways of interpreting the world. And the digital promotes this break breaks with linear perspective and the famous focal point. Now, talking about my work, how this relates to, this one comes from proposition three, uh, touch me not, and it's about, this is a series about contemporary technology. And again, I don't want to get into the content, but in this series, what I wanted is to break both with realism and with monocular perspective, and as you can see, here there's no focal point, no punctum, no three-dimensionality. What I was dreaming of is like an infinite <coughs> surface of forms uh, that could expand to infinite. It's sort of tapestry of forms, which is the antithesis of a traditional photo. And here I would like to recover something that we've, I've mentioned uh, before, and allow me to dig digress a bit. A bit. As you can see, I'm, I'm into machine. <laughs> but these machines are very important. And, and I'm, when I'm talking about machines, I'm talking about you know, microelectronics, nanotechnology, cybernetics. And they're important because they are the doors that are opening us to a new world. That doesn't mean that the new world, we should like the new world. We don't know how the new world is going to be. But it's certainly a new world coming through this technology. It's not an additive improvement of past technology. Nanotechnology is going to change the nature of our understanding of the, the relation between the human and the machines. Today we still have machines that we sort of handle. In the future these machines are, are going to be in our body 
and our brains. Uh, and this is in a not too distant bodies, uh, this, uh, future. And that has all sorts of moral, ethical, political implications, which I think are fascinating. But again, let's go back to the concept, the traditional thing of traditional photography was the predominant medium of modernity because it had, uh, it was sort of an allegory of the production systems of that time. You know, there was the Fordis production system of the mechanical reproduction, and this is the famous Walter Benjamin thesis, very equivalent to what photography added in the art world. Today, as I said, we are in the transformation of a biocybernetic reproduction area. And, it, and think about it, today it's the biospace and the cyberspace where the frontiers of technology and innovation are, and not only that, where the bill big capital investments are being made. So this is our new production system. And we are fortunate because photography versus other arts which are more rigid has also transformed itself in the perfect allegory of this production system. And why? Because we are working with not physical things, we are working with codes, we are working with invisibility, like the technology that is coming, and we are working with created new realities, which are, it's also, you know, what it's coming. Yes. So, let's go for the last, um, which is documentary referentiality. Taking a picture today is a discretionary art. We have billions of these files ready to be played around. It's perfectly valid to take a picture, but it's, it's a discretionary act that you have to know why you are doing it. The digital is expanding photography to recreate new worlds. And as I said, reality is conformed by facts and fiction, but they are the same room. The digital photography allows you to have facts and fiction in the same image. And I will try, and I'm, going, I'm getting to the end, I'm going to try to explain it a bit better with something that you, nobody should do, which is over explain a photo, but you know, what the hell. This is an image of Heads Will Roll, and um, the original image is much cooler, but anyway, it's much nicer, but anyway, it, it gives you an idea. This is a photo of my memory which is a photo made today of a past event. Usually this idea is, I find it very cool to make a photo of something that has already happened. This is a chance encounter with my lover in long time ago, the past. And with time, a forest has grown through my memory. And you know, there are parts that I cannot remember well. It's like a forest that is covering parts of the, of, of the image I have, of the memory I have. So I cannot be very precise of what was going on. But I remember extremely well her dress with the stripes, very well. And I remember very well the yellow of the afternoon sun in the facade, in the back facade. I remember it also very well. And I remember extremely well the sting of love in my heart and how the blood just concentrated in my heart. And I re also remember very well my deep desire to go and kiss her. Isn't that cool <laughs> to be able to do a photo of that? Mm -hmm. This is an expanded photography. So anyway, Heads Will Roll, which is the title of this presentation, is about today. It's about an archaeology of the present. It's the, about the end of the world as we know it. And it's about the advent of a world that we don't know how it's going to be, but we know that it's going to be very different. But it's also about expanded photography. It's about breaking the three rules of Rosalind Krauss. It's about the performative expression of photography through the video, through the books, through the prints. And it's about fighting tradition, boredom, and conservatism. And I would like, and this is directed obviously especially to the, to the younger 
part of the crowd, which is, you know, photography can be many things, and I mean, I'm not trying to pontificate what is right or what is wrong. But certainly what is important is it requires some thinking. And it requires some thinking of what do you want to make out of your photography. The second message I would like to leave is that we are in the middle of a total change of what photography is about. And this is extremely exciting and should be exciting for anybody who's interested in photography. Um, and for me, the worst thing is to look backwards. I mean, backwards is history and it's in the books. And finally, this is a quote by Picasso, which I find it, it's like a, one of a, the ruling things in my life, which is that any act of creation is first an act of destruction. So you have to first destroy and then create. And, and the way to do that, uh, it first you put your, the best of yourself, you go, you visit, you look, you learn, you study, you read, and then you start all over again. And remember, it really doesn't risk, it's a perception. There is no risk in what we do. Because nobody cares what we do. And so why not have fun and break things down? And that's the end of my presentation. Uh, Max, I want to say uh, thank you for laying out that framework so carefully and also inviting us uh, to think deeply about our medium and our times. Uh, we have um, time for question and answer. This microphone doesn't amplify your voice, it's just for the video. That's, uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a trick that I'm playing on you, but it's necessary for our, our video cast. So if you have a question, I'll pass around the mic. Uh, when you mentioned that picture, that uh, painting of cubism, it was a cubist painting by Pablo Picasso, right? And you said how people would refer to it as something that doesn't make sense versus a, realis a realistic painting. How do you feel about the cubist uh, movement? Because I feel like it actually made a whole lot of sense for photography and how it, it moved with mobile perspective and how it actually showed different fragments of time in one painting. So how do you feel about it? Okay, I, 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 this is a very interesting question, and I don't want to improvise it too much, and I don't want to sound frivolous. But I, I, again, I think that we are in a very uh, not similar, let's say, in a gross way, a similar situation as was. Cubism was a reaction to photography in reality. I mean, photography was much more efficient in the way p painting of the painting, what the p depicting what painting was showing at that time. So it was a, a sense of reaction of saying, OK, if we continue doing what we do, painting is dead. And in fact, Picasso, there's this sentence where when confronted to photography, said, has, what we do doesn't make sense anymore. Now, the question we have now as photographers is very similar. I mean, today, anybody's a photographer. I mean, anybody does very cool photos and the retouching instruments. And I mean, you go there. And, and so as an artist, doing something different that it's so easy to do today has to pose some questions, aside of the whole digitalization thing, uh, essential questions about the nature of our work. So I agree with you. Uh, uh, cubism had to occur in order for paintings to survive. And the question for us today is what things have to happen in photography for photography to survive and not be an antiquarian um, exercise. But I agree with you. Thank you very much. And I highly recommend uh, seeing the exhibit at the Klomp Ching Gallery because the installation and prints are just gorgeous. Um, I'm curious to know what artists that we should be looking at, who do you admire working today? Okay. Um, working today is a, it's a, a good question. I would say that uh, from a photography for me, the, the guy that I follow the most because I think it it's the guy that risks in every project, and it's uh, and it's a very very well known. Right? It's, it's Thomas Roof. I mean, for me, Thomas Roof is is a guy who each project is different, uh, risks everything in each project, while you know most of photographers do the same thing for the rest of through all their lives. Um, this guy is every project is different, and 
and it's of extreme quality and of extreme thought. So from a photography standpoint, it's, probably, it's certainly Thomas Roof, the guy that I follow with most interest. Um, but I like to think photography in an expanded way. And for me, the most uh, interesting guys are Polke, Baldessari, Rauschenberg. Those are Heineken, although, I mean, not so much, but, but still, I mean, I find his work very interesting. These are the, these guys that thought of photography in an expanded way. Even, I would say, uh, Warhol. I mean, these guys were really tried to push the limits of, of what photography is. And uh, they were, in fact, captured by the art world immediately because they were recognized as super quality. But the reality is that they had an incredible influence in, in, in photography. So those are the, that's the tradition that I look. There's, I haven't mentioned it, but, and, and I don't want to seem to be doing propaganda of, of a guy who has written something about me recently, but Lyle Rexel has this book, which is The Edge of Vision, which uh, I highly recommend because, and it has been a book, and I told him that without knowing him, it has been a book that I have read with passion because it's this tradition of alternative photography, and let's call it alternative because it was not the mainstream, that has been through the whole history. And I highly recommend that book because you find wonderful artists here. Uh, today there are, uh, what happens, I don't know how to pronounce their names in English, but, but anyway, there, here in America there are a couple of uh, extraordinary, let's call it abstract photographers that are also uh, very, very good. That's the people I follow. Roof, R-U-F-F. -F. His exhibition was fabulous on Saturday. Thank you so much. Um, I just wonder, what, what is your next project? Great. Um, the title, <laughs> it's called um, The Blue Summer Nights in French. And it's not because it's posh in French, but it's because it comes from a Rimbaud poem, which I like very much. Um, the concept behind this, uh, one of the main topics that I'm dealing with for some time now is the relationship of the humans and nature. We are more and more apart. I was reading recently this summer uh, a book by Hemingway, which is a beautiful book, by the way, about the Civil War and, uh, and Spanish Civil War. And, but the topic is not the war, it's just the, the physical relationship between ourselves and nature. No? And there was this description of this guy that who was going to be killed because he knew that troops were coming, and he describes what life is for him. And it really shocked me because his description, which is very nature-based, has nothing to do with my experience. And it's, you know, it's only 50 years ago. And so uh, this relationship that, you know, 50 years ago people had with nature, it's not there anymore. So anyway, uh, so this new project is about, about the, <laughs> it's difficult to say, but it's about the relationship of the most symbolic form of nature in civilization, which is the women. And women has, has been a topic very touching, very difficult. And if you think about art, uh, it ha the, the, the representation of, of women has been mainly driven, for good reasons, by, by feminist art. Um, I feel that it's time to recover with all humbleness and, and with all what we have learned in this 50 years period, um, the vision from a man. And uh, it's a particularly touching work that I'm doing. It's going to be a, it's a huge endeavor because I, my objective is to have around, you know, 100 different photos. And, um, and I'm putting a lot of love in this work. Um, the other, from a formal standpoint, um, I'm always been concerned that photography has a weakness in its nature, which is uh, if you go and see a Rembrandt, a painting, you go and you, you are delighted by, by the thing. But then you get close, and it has this, the texture has a lot of emotion, a lot of 
of significance, of meaning. In, photo in the photography, the, the surface, you know, it's transparent, and you are supposed to look at what's at the icon, what's going on there. But the surface itself, it's something that, um, and I've been trying to work on this. So, m in the line of heads with roll, which again combines and things this type of work, but I'm putting a lot of effort in the given significance to the surface without renouncing to photography. That's important because some people paint in on the surface and you know replicate what painting does or other art mediums are. I'm trying to stick only to photography, to the tools that photography in the 21st century is giving us, but trying to <coughs> overcome this meaningless nature of the surface. And uh, I'm quite happy with this <laughs> what is coming out, so we'll see. But, but this is a project that will be end the end of 2016, so I still have uh, a lot of hours in the studio. Um, I'm, I don't know how to word this up. During your lecture, you talked about files being an abstraction, a coded number, you know, computer code, etc. And then you talk about texture. How do you explain texture expressing a digital code in surface? Because before the lecture, we talked about what you meant by surface. And when I'm, I'm having trouble explaining it and bringing it out, but there seems to be kind of something not quite understandable that you have the abstraction of a digital file, then you have a concrete reality of texture, which is based in the analog world. So you're kind of trying to get the juxtaposition of a digital world and an analog world upon a surface. I think your description is perfect. It's, it's perfect, and you, you express yourself very well. This is precisely everything that is being done in the digital world is to create fictions of nature. If when you think of what the objective of virtual reality and you know, all these from games to more serious stuff is the, crea the creation of an apparent reality. Now, but again, Reality is just a matter of distance. If you get too close to the things, we are, what you're going to see is atoms, uh, electrons. So, so at the end of the day, we are talking about the same thing. And this is, I think, the most exciting part of, of digitalization. Uh, there is this now professor in MIT that says, you know, we've been very successful in computing and communication, uh, digitalization in computing. And, uh, but the, the next border, is not, it's not manufacturing by 3D printings, but creating the structures, digital structures of material reality. And that's one of the prime lines of this department in MIT. You know, it's creating a digital reality that it's, that it's solid. So the way I'm thinking about it is, again, who knows what reality is? And why shouldn't a fiction of what we thought was reality be as real as, as, as the other. And this is a challenge, and I don't know how I'm going to get out from it. <laughs> it may be a, a deep hole. <laughs> well, you've, uh, you've given us a lot to think about for the beginning of the school year, right? <laughs> like, oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so, is it all right, Jaime? We're gonna I want to thank everybody for coming. I want to thank you, because I've got to go read a lot of books. <laughs> Thank <you. laughs> Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thank you. With the truth. You will revise the historical assumptions in that, in, in, with that concept. The second is why I believe that digital changed everything forever. And that the, those assumptions that have led all the critical discussions on photography until today are obsolete uh, going forward. And the last part will be a bit about how this all relates to my work. Um, you will see that in most of the slides, certainly in the first part, there are some book references. Um, there are, most of them are very recent, are over the last 10 years, most of them. Uh, that doesn't mean that those books 
I agree with them, but all of them are written by very smart people that even when I disagree, they challenge myself. So I, I, there are recommendations to all of you if, if you're interested in the specific topic. So what I would like to start is with something very basic. We start with a first question, which is, what is photography for you? And the, a second corollary, which is, why should you care? And basically what I have collected here is, is two definitions, one coming from Encyclopedia Britannica and the other one from Wikipedia. One represents the uh, old tradition of photography and the other one, we might say, the new one. And just let's read it for a second and I will highlight the crucial differences among both. Britannica says, photography is the method of recording the image of an object through the action of light. And it, it sounds uh, quite, uh, quite okay. But then Wikipedia says something completely different. It says it's the science, art, and practice of creating durable images by recording light. Between these two definitions, there are at least, at least the one that I see, is there are two contradictions. The first one is the role of the photographer. What does the photographer actually do? Record or create? Britannica says that they, what the photographer does is record. Wikipedia is create. But the second, and also quite interesting, is what does the camera do? Uh, one, it says that records an image, and the other says records light. Let's go back to the tradition of 150 years of photography. The traditional stand was Britannica's. Is what a photographer does is to record. And that has, comes with huge implications, conceptual implications and moral implications even. Because if record has also, recording has also its definition. And recording is to give evidence of something. And evidence also comes with its own definition. Evidence is that this something exists, it's real, and it's true. So the tradition of recording implies two very important assumptions. One is that the object is true, and second, that its image is true. So, the first thesis that I'm going to advance in, in of this presentation is that precisely this link with reality, this supposed link with the real, with the truth of photography, which has, was, and has been, and still is for some, or for many, the essence of photography, together with the idea that the true reflect, uh, uh, representation of a world is the linear perspective, the, you know, the, that comes from the jet Renaissance, and this is a, a very Eurocentric uh, concept, both are deeply first reactionary and they are false. So that's the first assumption and we'll see how I develop that. Because let's explore some of the implications of this traditional assumption, uh, some historical uh, um, implications. A very substantial part of the work that it was done early on in the turn of the, 20, uh, of the 20th century, at the beginning of the 20th century was, you know, if photography represents the real, the truth, and you are a political photographer, conscientious, concerned about repression, uh, uh, concerned about democracy, then photography should, be, should represent and show, should show the truth of the oppression the truth of the subjugation, the truth of the, of the humiliation um, in, your, the, in the places where you live. So the role of the photographer would be to certify through photography that that was the case. So the assumption, and that has been a long tradition that still is in a very substantial part of, of today's photography, is photography is the best tool, the perfect tool to represent this situation is the best tool to represent and to promote democracy. Is the best tool to promote freedom. Okay, so that that was the assumption, and this is why. Let's yep. What what I call the democratic document was born. No, the idea of representing the social movements and the social truth of our societies through photography, and through this link to the real. But, but, what happened very early on is that, you know, yes, it's true, it was great to show democracy, but 
the Nazis did a fantastic use of uh, photography as a political tool. Photography now. Uh, its challenges, its uh, opportunities, and its difficulties. Um, but I would like to start with a caveat, which is the following. I'm not a scholar, and that means that uh, this is going to be a sort of performance lecture, which translates into my ambition here is not to convince anybody about my ideas. My ambition here is, if I'm successful, to challenge some of your ideas. But uh, you know, it's up to you to decide whether it are worthwhile or not. And again, I'm not trying to convince and to portray a thesis that should be right or wrong. Um, what you're going to listen is sort of perhaps an old style manifesto, which basically manifestos in the old avant-garde were had two objectives. The first one was to push ideas to the limit, to their limit, to the limit of nearly the nonsense. But secondly, even more important, to push the ideas into action. So the format that you are going to see in my presentation is to try to push these ideas to their, as I was saying, the limits of the nonsense. Um, I think that that's the right mood to think about photography today. We are, uh, because basically I think that in the same way that the society and our world is changing for, in a deep sense, and we will talk about why that is the case, I think photography is also ready for a major change. And, it, and we are already leaving the first stages of this uh, uh, complete change in the basic premises of what photography is about. So I will discuss three things uh, today in this presentation. First, one thing that has been an essential topic for photography since its invention, it's 150 years ago, which is the relationship of photography with the real. Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. Photographer Max de Esteban lives and works in Barcelona. We are thrilled to have him here tonight on occasion of his solo show at Klomchin Gallery, which is currently on view. Uh, Max is a Fulbright alumnus who holds a PhD from the Universitat Ramon Lull in Catalonia and a master's from Stanford University. His work has been featured at the Deutsches Technik Museum, Rencontre Internationale at the Palais de Tokyo, Paris, and Darmstadter Tag der Fotografie, among others. He is the recipient of the National Award of Professional Photography in Spain, and the Jury Special Award in Photo Festival Poland. Um, collections include the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, Museo de Arte Moderna do Rio de Janeiro, and the Deutsches Technik Museum. Max has published three monographs to date, uh, Elegies of Manumission, Nasrelli Press, 2012, Heads Will Roll, Hatje Kant, 2014, which was selected as a book of the year by Lens Culture, Proposiciones, Propositions, La Fabrica Editorial, 2015. So please give a warm welcome to Max de Esteban to our lecture series. Thank you very much. Um, okay, first of all, thank you very much for your coming here. It's a real honor. I would like to thank also Jaime for inviting me to these lectures and the School of Visual Arts for hosting this event. So, I really I want to thank you all, uh, but especially you for coming. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is about uh, 